So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this lecture of opportunity. My name is Hayat Alvi. We are very privileged to have Dr. Ashok Swain, uh, and I'll read very briefly from his bio, and then I'll turn it over to him, and I will be advancing his slides for him as he speaks. He does want a robust Q&A, so be prepared to ask him some good questions. Ashok Swain is a professor and head of department uh, of the Department of Peace and Conflict Research. He is the UNESCO Chair on International Water Cooperation and the Director of Research School of International Water Co Cooperation at Uppsala University in Sweden. He is also the founding editor-in-chief of Environment and Security Journal. Dr. Swain is a renowned and outspoken activist for democracy and human rights in India. And his talk today is entitled, In India, Democracy is in its Deathbed. Please welcome Dr. Ashok Swain. The floor is yours, sir. Thank, thank you, Aya. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure uh, speaking to um, the class here. Uh, it's a, I don't know how, how I will be, you know, uh, starting it because the reason is, uh, as uh, my introduction goes, I'm, I'm an academic. My research is uh, uh, all sorts of uh, peace and conflict, climate, uh, water. Uh, you name it, but um, I have also a side which looks at the democracy and development in different parts of the world. Uh, these days, I don't really lecture on India, uh, neither here nor uh, to Indian universities, because uh, frankly, though I can't even talk to the Indian universities. Um, so it's it's a somehow. So that's why it took me some. Uh, slide to when I was asked uh, to give this lecture, try to put it something together. I will, I will, I will try. It's a, it's a, India is a vast country. It will be yeah, lots of issues to cover. Uh, but I think I will try to be as precise as possible. And then uh, would would very much like to uh, get the question answer. I mean, um, because I think it will be too boring to listen to my voice for a long time. It's it's it's, it's not going to be nice, actually. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I think India as a country, as I think it's, it's a very difficult to get a grasp of it uh, for anyone, even you are born and brought up in that country because it's so vast, so different, so I mean, from the uh, not only the ethnically, not only culturally, religiously, whatever you name it, uh, regionally, all it's a language, linguistically, it's very different country. Uh, so I think what happens, uh, we usually try to uh, look a certain aspects of it and make our mind or make our impression of the country uh, on that basis. Uh, I was actually yesterday giving a talk to uh, several of the. Um, uh, academics, those who are uh, 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 kind of, uh, uh, I won't say rebel, but they, they are uh, somehow opposing the autocratic regimes in their, they're all diaspora academic, they're autocratic regimes in their country back home. Uh, and I think uh, there are several of them from India were there. And I think it's uh, interesting to see that uh, uh, what sort of aspects they look at it. Uh, so it's a very different from, uh, I mean, if you if you ask an academic uh, also, even doing research on democracy, uh, then they will focus on a particular part of it. And that becomes a challenging. So that's why I'm saying that, you know, I will not able to cover everything. I will try to cover some but we we will we, we, we will take up whatever in the question answer session if there is anything i would be happy to explain if i can uh, india has been a, for seven decades the world's most populous democracy or was uh, i mean um, india got independence in 1947 uh, since then there has been always a power, peaceful transition of power through elections um, there have been a kind of uh, uh, 
20 uh, odd months in from 1975 to 77, there was an emergency, internal emergency was declared by the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. And that was the time many of the, I mean, many of the uh, civil rights, uh, political rights were taken out by the government that time. So that is a kind of a black mark on Indian democracy in that period. But I think overall, uh, but of course, the same um, person brought back the election and the election she was defeated. So then it the system ran as it was before. Uh, of course, there was a one party was in power for a long period of time. That's Congress party. Uh, and that was the time, of course, initial period, uh, the democracy was uh, doing well in the beginning. And then one, when one party remains in power, uh, then there was a certain kind of uh, uh, power control took place. So many of the institutions, organizations were not exactly developed the way in the beginning under the uh, Nehru would started. Uh, but then what happened in the last uh, three decades or more than three decades, um, particularly since uh, mid 80s, so it happened or the, you know, nine, uh, supper, yeah, mid 80s and um, it, it is, uh, the, it was more of a coalition government. Uh, so the no no party was in power. So there was a not single party till 2013, uh, 14. And uh, so there was a period when um, you could see that uh, democracy to a large extent thrived in the country. Uh, and this is where, uh, because uh, there was, of course, there will be a lot of accommodation, lots of uh, discussions because it's a coalition politics. But you could see the democracy in action in many ways. During that period also, uh, that was uh, India became a kind of uh, uh, economic growth took place. People usually say that, you know, you need a country, a concentrated power or uh, uh, like a, a autocracy that to, to, to do well in democracies, particular death things from the East Asia, we got that kind of ideas. Uh, but when, and then Indian uh, growth was also being mocked as a Hindu rate of growth uh, because it was a very little uh, economic growth taking place in the economic growth terms. We can come back to this discussion whether the economic growth were materializing in bringing the, you know, uplifting the poverty proper people from those who are in the poverty line. But the overall economic growth was marginal. Uh, but we, the India got into an, a very remarkable economic growth, uh, starting from the 2003-2004, and it continued at least 2015-16. And the idea, I mean, that time, there was this idea that whether democracy versus autocracy, which are in the developing countries, which are good for the economic growth. Uh, but that is the time India's economic growth really brought a challenge for that Chinese economic growth that you, you can have a democracy, you can have this coalition governments, you can really do fight among yourself electorally, uh, politically, always, uh, you know, uh, if when you live in the United States, you know very well that how the democracy functions, it might look very disordered, it might look very much of kind of a way that it's probably not working. But when you look at the economic return, economic growth return, that really did much better than even China sometimes. So it is, it's, 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 a, it's a somehow that time the political scientists got into this debate that whether, you know, that we have to revise that whether you need an autocracy uh, to autocratic power or a, a strong leader to really go for economic growth. You can also with a coalition government, you can really do it. However, the, since 2014, there has been growing concern that uh, about the India state of democracy. What happened in 2014? Uh, it's the uh, Hindu Nationalist Party, BJP came to power. Of course, they were also in power from um, uh, 1998 to 2004, six years that time, but they were not exactly got, had got the um, the majority in the parliament to run the country. 
Uh, so that time, um, Otto A.B. Bajpayee was the prime minister. Um, of course, there have been few things here and there it happened, but I think it was not exactly like the kind of threat into Indian democracy which came in from 2014. Uh, because the government which under Narendra Modi came to power with a clear cut majority, uh, more than, um, and that is where uh, the party, the Hindu National Par Nationalist Party, which took up agenda. And I will say why it is the challenge. Uh, of course, the key challenges has been seen for the last nine and a half years, uh, the independence of the judiciary. You need these key institutions to work. Uh, when we compare with the United States, of course, the United States, you know, there have been um, the politicization of the, uh, you, you, you have probably in the Supreme Court, but we have a very different in India. The India, actually, the judiciary in a different level, I mean, of course, uh, you know, we've, uh, it's much more affected from the lower level to the, to the higher level. Everywhere, the judiciary has been uh, either used with the, uh, all sorts of power or uh, kind of uh, carrot and sticks. Uh, using that, the judiciary has, the independence has been quite marginalized. Election commission, which was actually a extremely important, India we used to be, uh, I remember when your Florida, Florida issue came and the George W. Bush was uh, being elected as the president for the first time. Uh, that time Indians were really saying that we can really show how the United States to hold the elections. Uh, the India's Election Commission was absolutely a fantastic institution which India had developed. Uh, but that institution has been, uh, you know, uh, going through a very serious crisis because uh, it's it's not it, it's somehow it's it's a power is being taken taken it's a people are being put in there those who really will listen to the government and uh, the who will select that is also a big thing going on when the. Uh, India's uh, uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice wanted to be a member, but that is being taken away. Those kind of things leads to a huge popular protest in city, in Israel. I mean, if you remember when you take away the power from the judiciary, the Israeli has been seeing or before this, whatever happened on 7th of October, before that 40 weeks of protest. But India doesn't really, they don't care. This doesn't happen much. Then the military also under scrutiny. Military is a professional military India had, uh, and it still has to a large extent. Uh, but the military appointment uh, is being has been taken for some time in a different ways. The kind of um, way the military is being used for political purposes that really creates some kind of uh, um, question mark how the military is really keeping that kind of professionalism keep or non-partisan character anymore or not. Uh, whether, up in, of course, overall it looks still is, is working, but I think there has been a serious doubts about how the military will function uh, if there is a certain kind of situation comes in, um, like what happened in the United States in 2020, yeah, the last when the Trump election took place, 20. Uh, so, so this is the kind of idea that we do have. Decline in the protection of civil liberties. Um, many people have been arrested. Many people have been arrested on various issues. Uh, they are not being given the many means, those who are activists, academics, uh, you name it. Uh, and this has been a kind of ways that to uh, give any sort of uh, restrictions that who want to raise a voice, those who want to raise a voice for any kind of issues, which is not exactly going um, the way what the government wants. Uh, I do have a long list. I can come in and you can, you know, those are the things which is uh, the civil liberties are extremely in, in, in a, in India, let, let me put it this way. India was never a perfect democracy, never, ever. Uh, but the question is, there is there was a threshold where you can operate and we could operate. And that has broken for a long time back now. Uh, increasing restriction on freedom of expression and the press. Uh, it, is, it is almost impossible for uh, whatever I'm saying here, to say, if I would have been uh, employed in an Indian university to say that, 
to you. Uh, that is not possible at all. Uh, and there has been also all sort of, uh, it's not only academics, it's anyone who is giving, um, in, coming up with any kind of uh, opinion which goes against the government, goes against the regime, you will be considered an anti-Indian or anti-national, you name it. I mean, or a Pakistani supporter or a Chinese supporter, you name it. There are different ways they can put you in, in that bracket it will be very difficult to get out of that bracket by yourself. Then there is a electoral manipulation and polarization is taking place. I was mentioning about the election commission. Uh, election commission, there has been a question mark about how the election being held, how the elections being manipulated. Even recently, a professor of a private university brought out a paper which was saying that how the last election the government or the party in power tried to or manipulated the election and that person i mean there was a huge uh, um black backlash by the regime against that uh, professor uh, the professor has to leave that university all kinds of things happen but the polarization is a way you know when once you in the election time uh, if you openly or the political leaders go out openly and polarize the electorates, then the situation becomes very, very different, uh, including the prime minister uh, goes to the election. They all go to the election campaigns, campaign that's, you know, uh, naming the minorities, naming the Muslims and all the kind of things. When you polarize on that basis, it becomes into a way that it's very difficult for other political parties, centralist parties to really uh, compete you in that process. The three things, I, I, on three things, when the Indian elections, if the election campaign is being built and the uh, opposition is regular centralist opposition try to challenge, that will be very difficult when it comes to issue of Muslims, issue of Kashmir and issue of Pakistan. On these three issues, the the Hindu nationalist government will have always an upper hand. And if the polarization takes place on these three issues, it will be almost impossible for an opposition to out uh, smart or outclass this of uh, the present regime. We can move to the second thing. India, I think we need to look at it though. Again, go back to 1947. Uh, it's uh, the the Indian um, democracy, you or the uh, when India became independent, uh, India India's independence come with a very a peaceful struggle under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. It, Congress was the leading that struggle. Uh, in that freedom struggle, uh, it was more of a. Of course, we know that was a, when the India got in independence in 1947. One of the very first countries, first colonies to get independence and got the independence, you know, waging a struggle uh, peacefully. Most of the peaceful freedom struggle uh, that even continues to inspire people, leaders in different parts of the world, from Martin Luther King to. Um, to South Africa, to even Kosovo, you name it. There have been different places. Still, uh, Gandhi really influences that. On that freedom struggle, when the but the country when it got independence, it also was partitioned. Uh, a country part of you know when it was become Pakistan, connecting now the present Bangladesh was East Pakistan and the West Pakistan with the present Pakistan. When they were formed, it was formed on the basis of uh, giving a homeland to the Muslims. Muslims were, uh, so that was a um, country, but then India wanted to, or India, under the Gandhi and Nehru, they wanted to remain a country as a secular country. Uh, it, it was a kind of way that also there was a large number of Muslims still live in India. But there are Sikhs, there are Christians, there are a number of other minorities who are living in India. India's Hinduism is also very fragmented, different into the different parts of the region. So there was, it was a political decision. It was a moral decision. It was a right decision to make a country as a secular country. Uh, and that, that's what also um, brought the country to uh, able to survive the democracy so long. Uh, so the 
it was Gandhi was killed by this Hindu nationalist, one of the Hindu nationalist uh, militant in the 1948 January itself. So since then, the Nehru became the primary leader of the par party and he, till his death uh, in 1964. Uh, so I think he was, uh, uh, my, in, to my mind, I find Nehru was more probably the most important leader for the survival of India as a democracy and a secular country till that this time. Uh, because initially at that period, uh, he he was a Democrat by heart. So it was uh, many things which he took into the decision. He built these institutions at that time, which really helped the country to uh, because the country, there have been a number of question mark when India became a country, uh, 1947. I mean, of course, you can go back to this kind of cultural thing, but India has never been into this shape as a country under one rule. Uh, we must realize that uh, India is a new country. It might, it is an old civilization, but that's a very different country. But India was a new country established in 1947. India was a country with a project brought together from the different parts of the region put together on Rwanda administration. When even the British has left 500 plus uh, princely states or the kingdoms, they were within the country. They also were merged into the, uh, I mean, of course, we know the other kinds of problems associated with some of the issues. But I think what happened, the country, there have been many uh, uh, Indian experts abroad and within India also had questioned whether India will survive or not. India not only survived, India thrived on because it was a democracy and it was a secular country. Uh, though it was from the very beginning, the constitution was a very, you know, a secular constitution, but to, they put in the 1976, I was mentioning in the time, at the time of emergency, where those period 1975 to 77, uh, in, so the, the, under that emergency period, there was a um, constitutional amendment. And in that constitutional amendment, they specifically put the secular in the preamble of the constitution. It's just to, you know, uh, so, so the secularism is a large, is a major part of the India's democratic character. And I think we must realize that without secularism, it will be extremely difficult to imagine India remaining as a country of this unit, of this character and this type in the long run. And I will, I will, I can come back to this answer uh, or questions if you have later on, because it's, it's, it's it needs to be, uh, put into the context and put it in a, you know, in a number of examples. Uh, then there have been, you, you see, we also need to look at the Hindu nationalism, um, uh, which I was talking about the government now, um, which is since in 2014, and there was a six years period from 98 to 2020. But before that, very few people were touching them uh, as, as such. I mean, there were been sometimes that's like nobody wanted to deal with them directly. Of course, there is a opposition, non-Congress opposition was dealing them with them, but they were not exactly considered the politically, uh, they were almost politically untouchable before 98, let me put that way. Uh, but this um, Hindu nationalism is not a new thing because this one, we need to look at it when it was established. It was established in 1925 uh, RSS when India was under Congress, eh, sorry, in the, under the British colonial rule. Um, this is the exactly the time Muslim Brotherhood was also created in Egypt. Uh, there is, uh, uh, and also we need to realize that this Hindu uh, nationalist organization in the 1925, it was not supporting Congress or the freedom struggle. It was uh, primarily opposing it or siding with the British. Uh, so there have been a number of ways, number of scholars might compare this, how the Muslim Brotherhood and the RSS creation in they have similarity and what are the roles in their creation the colonial power had played uh, to divide the country's oppositions, to divide the independence movement. So I think this, this is something, again, another topic, which is, but that is a history. And of course, we need to learn from the history, but we should see how it is uh, also. Um, and we also need to realize that the same Hindu nationalists, those who are in power, 
those who are forcing people to sing India's uh, national anthem all the time, you know, carry the national flag all the time, they didn't accept the Indian national song. They didn't accept the Indian national flag. They didn't accept the India's national constitutions when it came in the 1940s, 50s. They even they accepted only for the first time this RSS headquarters got into, a, they were forced to raise the India's national flag only 20 years back. So I think the, 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 it's, it's a, somehow we need to realize it's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, historically how they have played how the different role they have played uh, then hindu nationalism came to power of course it was in the 1977 when this emergency after the emergency there was a two and a half years of a, a centrist party came to power though the hindu nationalists came to power uh, hindu were a part of that but they were merged into a particular party which is centrist party uh, so they were not exactly a separate party that time or separate party of that uh, government, which was under power in power for those three years. But since 98 to 2004, that six years, they could create a coalition party. But the significant turning point really came when Modi's, Modi's uh, astounding election victory in 2014 with an absolute majority. And we need to know who is Modi. Uh, also, I hope you know that because Modi was also before he became prime minister in 2014 for more than 10 years, he was not allowed to enter to United States, Canada and Europe. He's, he was not given visa to come. Why he was not being given visa? Because he was being considered as a person somehow responsible or at least under his watch, there was an anti-Muslim riot took place in Gujarat when he was the chief minister. And that is the reason um, which has been a kind of, uh, you know, the uh, at least in the uh, North America and Europe, European US countries had blocked his entry to or his visit to this part of the world. So I think this is, uh, and suddenly when he became the prime minister in 2014, we forgot those things. Uh, and we have a very ha good habit of forgetting these kind of things of these kind of people uh, because of our interest. Um, <clears throat> so, and again, this, you know, if you probably know that what happened recently, a BBC documentary came in about, about the 2000 anti-Muslim riot in Gujarat where 2000 Muslims were butchered. Uh, and that was even not allowed to be, this was banned in India. Um, all sorts of things happened. Those who even saw, uh, saw it in the university campuses, they were prosticated, some people put in jail. Even they uh, also went into the BBC office, uh, raided the BBC office. That's another issue. That's how the freedom of press I was talking about. So the what has happened when he became the prime minister, gradually, there was an observable shift towards majoritarian politics, but it was also covered within this pseudo-nationalism. Why I call pseudo-nationalism? I think mentioned before that this, this was happening, that they had their... These are the same people, those who are not accepted the flag. These are the same people who have not accepted the constitution. These are the same people, those who have not accepted the national song, but now they want people to every time to say this. And if you don't, then you are, I mean, you know, you cannot force people to do anything because it's, it's, if it is a democracy. So I think this is somehow all these things came up. And this is not, as I see it, it is not exactly love for your country, that you are a patriot. You, the, the, the nationalism is absolutely geared towards you hate another country. And that's Pakistan you have to hate if you have to... And the Pakistan hate Pakistan has also come with the hate your minority or hate your Muslims. So it's a, it's a very close connection that how they are really why that's why I call it the pseudo nationalism. They are hiding it, and that's through it because that's why it's the majoritarian politics is being that's a, it's supposed to be a Hindu country. It's a Hindu identity. It's a Hindu cultural pride that makes the country two hundred million Muslims, twenty five million Christians, twenty five million Sikhs. Uh, I mean, of course, in that Hindus, Hindus are not a kind of a very specific category because there are the um, the Dalits, or the, we call it scheduled caste, those who are 
untouchables uh, the, the, the belong belong to the caste system there are also indigenous people there is all these things which which and then there is a, also um, the upper caste then the other backward classes so there are all sorts of divisions are there but they wanted to create a hindus as a one unit and living aside this and creating a, a identity with a cultural pride and it's also very interesting i mean um, the interesting thing is that you how you really create a pride how you really create some things uh, which needs to be created uh, of course you manipulate the history uh, there has been a lots of new history is being written it's 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 always history is always a political project i know that but the history has to be historian writes the history not any anyone else not the politicians write the history is the politic it's a political project but the the politicians are writing the history which are uh, to somehow uh, putting the blames for everything which is uh, the mogul rule which was and then they forget that the under the mogul rule india was the richest country so it is all these things which are all sorts of blame game goes on um, uh, and the kind of new history is being built Uh, and the cultural they also creating new heroes which were not probably existing or the history doesn't really accept it but they have they are creating this so the re, it's a, it's a history is reinterpreted rewritten to demonize muslims mostly and also christians so i think i think we need to realize that uh, it's a it's a vicious project where you teach uh, the young students the kind of history which is being reflected in the you know and it's a, it's a, it's it's a long term challenge which is coming to the country which is probably will be a very devastating much more than anything else uh, the whether the present regime stays or the gets defeated or if it gets defeated in election whether it leaves the power but the kind of education is being given to the students given to the people or particularly the young generation which is the way it is being trained that's create a kind of challenge which i don't know how long that is going to be uh, really viable thank you then to i think it's a democracy and secularism we it's a minority rights is a very crucial part in in any 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 uh, democracy uh, of course otherwise it's become majoritarian authoritarianism um if the minority rights are not protected if minority rights are not respected the democracy is not democracy it becomes a majoritarian autocracy and i think it's we must realize that uh, it is very important the minority rights are protected in any democracy otherwise this will not remain a democracy and that's the way the populist nationalist all over the world do have this kind of majoritarian and theft of that we have the 50.1% veto votes 50.1% vote and we can change the law and we can and that's a easy way also to marginalize major minorities and gets the majority vote and i think it's a, we need to realize that uh, the uh, india with this muslims as i was mentioning 200 uh, million more christians 6 25 or million 30 millions and the, and you name it all sorts of religion exist in that country uh, there is unfortunately there is a huge religious discrimination uh, taking place um, it is uh, uh, whenever I, anyone ask me that uh, you know it's very easy to say yeah, it's as you can say well, there is always uh, people say what is what is that religious discrimination even i live in a country in sweden uh, it's always that you know what is it? sweden is everything a perfect country uh, there was i i, I just there was a, here uh, i think he was from moroccan origin author wrote some time back uh, that uh, you just become one day wear my skin and go to the outside and you realize what kind of uh, discrimination exists you one day wear a, a skull cap and walk in uh, around in delhi and you will realize what kind of discrimination exists you don't need to uh, because it's it's a very easy for those who have uh, you know come from the majority and majority background we always don't really see that the day to day discriminations which carry on everywhere including this country in sweden 
but when it becomes politically, institutionally, at the state level, not only approved, but encouraged, when everything goes into that, you are uh, proud to be a majoritarianist uh, ideas, then of course, it doesn't matter. You do it because you also get, you not only anybody you look down upon, you will get political benefit for it. There has been escalation on hate crimes and violence against minority groups. It's, it, it has increased dramatically. Of course, it depends on which state you go, because India is a federal state, country. It uh, depends on the which state. Of course, you won't see that in a large part of uh, um, southern India or part of eastern India. But if you go to northern India, then you will find that what kind of violence and hate crimes exist. And then the, uh, there is a minority rights, including the freedom to practice one's religion without fear. Uh, there are all these things which are happening. Uh, I mean, if I carry on, go on, this will take uh, five days minimum. Um, it is impossible now for the Muslims in many states even to openly pray, forget about anything else. Uh, if any Muslim man dares to fall in love, whether they call him fall in love, that's an Indian term, uh, but whether if he wants to have a partner, with a, it's a, um, a, a Hindu partner, probably he is most likely to be lynched any time. Uh, so I think it's, we, we need to realize that this is this is this is a country which is uh, where uh, not very you know one or two or three or five million Muslims live. It's two hundred million more Muslims live. It's not only that. It's also we see that how much uh, it's not only Muslims. What is happening in Manipur? It's a state which is also you know recently has been in for for the last five months. It has been in news. Uh, in one day, in 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 in, uh, in the 36 hours in the in May last this year, almost 300 churches were burned. These are Christians. Many of the Christians' uh, 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 places of worship, uh, whatever is uh, you name it in UP, Uttar Pradesh, or Chhattisgarh, uh, or even the state I come from, Odisha. What is that? I mean, there have been also when there have been the uh, Christian areas pockets, you will see also attack against Christians. So it's a, it's a, it's a somehow it is it's it's happening. Um, uh, then there has been also the controversial. It's not only happening at the uh, you know um, beyond the, the, what you call it uh, in, the, in 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 like this. It is also happening, changing the rules, changing the laws. It is not only happening because the people have been getting the free hand. It's not because because people or the political party supporters doing it. It's the also party in power changing the law. There is a controversial change to the citizenship law, which has been that if anyone comes from the um, uh, up in South Asia to uh, you know to come to come to come to India, uh, ask for the refugee status. Uh, it's only everyone is allowed except a Muslim, uh, and that's some kind of. Some, I mean, it's it's. It, it, if you are a secular country, you don't do that. Uh, but also the Muslims, even if you look at Pakistan, there are large number of Muslims or other Afghanistan's. They are also discriminated, isn't it? So why you make those kind of rules? Then there is also a citizenship. Uh, um, uh, which started in Assam, that who is a citizen, who is a not, because there have been, it's a long issue that people are blaming that the people came from Bangladesh. There was a, uh, but the, when it came, there was also a threat that it will be done, or at least the home minister came and saying that it will be done all over the country. Of course, it has stopped now. So those kind of things that if it will be all over the country, in India, even I don't have, I was, when I was born, there was no paper exist. How shall I prove that I am I'm I'm from India? There is no paper in my village. There was no hospital where I will get my birth certificate. So removal of at the in, then the then the you know the I was mentioning there have been some princely states. Then the princely states were became part of India. That the Kashmir was a if I want to go on Kashmir, then it will be again a long story. But let's put it this way. Kashmir has been when Kashmir being a Muslim majority province was 
large part of Kashmir was kept in India, it was on the promise that it will be an auto, remain certain with some sort of autonomy. And that auto, autonomy was given within the Article 370. After Modi came to power, into, came back to power or the, the return, sorry, retained the power in with the bigger majority in 2019 election, he went on, he just without any discussions, without any discussion in the parliament or any way to having a national or even involving the Kashmir people, he removed the Article 370. And since then, Kashmir remained is is in a, in a of course you know you you, you all all store of storage but uh, we also thought that the Gaza it, it was also peaceful for some time. Uh, beef ban and cow vigilantism. Um, you know there is a very strange or something very. Um, um, a, uh, everybody thinks that Indians are vegetarians or Hindus are vegetarians. That's not true. Eighty percent Indians are. I mean, they, they do eat, uh, what do you call it, no, meat or fish or something. So it's an egg. So it's, a, it's not the Indians are that or every Indian is, 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 is a vegetarian. And that's a kind of um, language has been used by particularly upper, class, upper caste Hindus and to show that the whole rest of the India is that. But of course, so there, is a, there is a beef. It's not only the Muslims and Christians used to eat beef. There have been also a number of sections of Hindus, they also used to be. But the beef has been an issue uh, in many states that beef ban has been taking place before even the Modi came to power. But it was not given that the vigilante group were not given the open um, uh, freedom that they can really lynch Muslims. Uh, you won't believe that the people are going to their uh, Muslim houses with police and finding out if their freeze has their beef or not, taking the freeze out with the outside for the forensic test. That's what's happening nowadays. People are being lynched to them. Not only Muslims, mostly Muslims, but of course Christians, of course indigenous people. They have been forced to, and they're being lynched by the uh, this kind of uh, mob. And there have been also instances. Those, those who are lynching the minorities, they are giving the political patronage. They even sometimes contesting elections and winning it. Then attack against Christians, Christians, there has been a huge increase, particularly during Easter and Christmas. I always read that, you know, it's, it's a lots of things happens that time. It's unfortunately the report is very minimal because most of the focus has been on the violence against Muslims. But the Christian community gets quite affected. Sorry, you wanted to say something? No, no, someone was coughing. Go ahead. Oh. Then the Sikh community. I think uh, uh, you're probably aware of what is happening now between Canada and India. Uh, the Canadian Prime Minister has accused India's agencies of... Uh, committing a political assassination in Canadian soil to a Sikh separatist leader, uh, which is absolutely, it was never been there before. Uh, it was always the Indian agencies, intelligence agencies were accused or uh, the Pakistan, India usually accuse each other. Nobody takes them seriously, but that's what for the, for the first time a country which is uh, the West and particularly Canada has accused it officially that this is what happened. Why this happened? What has happening? I mean, this is again, the, if we go back to this Sikh uh, separatism or what they call it, the Khalistan state movement is another big issue. It has been not new. It has come from the 80s going on quite a big way, but it went down quite a, uh, drastically after a Sikh became prime minister from 2004 to 2014. After that, I think it has been again emerged, particularly at the diaspora level. Uh, but of course, you know, it's, it's becoming a very big issue uh, in India because that also uh, organized, uh, because when there was a farmer protest took place, you probably have heard of it because last year it was a big protest. And in that protest, uh, the mostly, of course, there are Hindus, Sikh farmers, but mostly Sikh farmers, Punjab farmers coming from there. 
they're all called Khalistani. They're all being branded by the party uh, that they were all the separatists. There are people those who went from outside, from um, Canada, from US, from Europe, to uh, help them because, as you know, the Sikhs have very strong network within them. Those who support them, they were also called the uh, they call Khalistanis, means the separate Sikh separatists. So, uh, and so it is. It, it's become a much worse now, and I think it is also being used for political purposes. You won't imagine the kind of language, the kind of press which is the Canadian prime minister is getting after he went on to in India, after he uh, alleged that, or he went on outside, went to the parliament, Canadian parliament and told that the India agencies are involved in this. There is a rise of hate, hate speech the, against minority communities becoming disturbingly common. It was not new, but it was hidden before. It was all being given, but now it has become a politically fashionable politically beneficial to do that. And this is not, the head speech comes from everywhere. It doesn't, head speech doesn't come from the ordinary people. Head speech comes from the top. You name it, it comes and this goes on. I think I'm taking too long, which is, so, I, I was, okay, I'll scientific tempo. I think this is three things which was quite, uh, when India became independence, Nehru became the prime minister. Three things were the core different, made India different from Pakistan or other post-colonial states that time. Democracy, secularism, and scientific temper. Nehru was an atheist. So I think what he did that he was uh, much more into the science. Of course, he knew, understood India. He was allowing the, you know, he was not a kind of state which is moved into like a Marxist state. But I think, but the scientific temper was most important part of his political philosophy. And India has also part of the constitution and it continued. And you also need to realize India being a country, a world cultural civilization, it has its own um, myths, it has its own uh, Practices, old practices, so it has to be moved out to being, you know, uh, in the new era. So, what has happened? I mean, we see all the successes uh, of this. Uh, of course, Modi takes this um, um, propagates that you know, recently India's uh, landing on the moon uh, and all these things. But you, you need to go back to that when it started, where it started, and where it has reached. Be saying this, there has been there is a there is a lot of evidences, and it also comes from this Hindu nationalist political uh, background that the a lot of pseudo scientific claims, traditional beliefs, without scientific verification, they are being imposed on the people. Uh, there, are, I mean, even you see, the first few months of Modi came, became the prime minister, he went to a meeting and he said that. The Ganesh, you know, the Lord, the Indi, one of, I mean, India has, uh, the Hindus have many uh, uh, gods. Uh, and one of the uh, important god is Ganesh, who has the elephant trunk, elephant head. Uh, he said that India must have a very good, um, what do they call it? Um, uh, a, a, a medical science, improved in medical science that time that they could really do the plastic surgeon surgery and replaced one uh, with the elephant head on a, a god's head. That's the prime minister of a country saying, imagine what will be the others, what kind of way it can go on. So there have been several ways he, he himself has said, and also it's a, any political leader from that party makes all sorts of claims. Uh, I mean, uh, when the COVID became, uh, COVID also created a lots of things. I mean, of course, they were targeting Muslims, they are targeting Christians, there were various reasons, but all kinds of nonsensical uh, things came up. There have been uh, uh, this cow urine became, now cow urine has become the most proudest thing of this Hindu nationalist movement. Uh, the cow dung, uh, you name it, the present league law minister of India, he even said that the, a papad, you know, that's Indian uh, some kind of uh, snacks or savory snacks called the papadam. That he even went into the media saying that if you use you 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 eat it, then you will be cured by the cured from the 
COVID. That, he's the law minister now. So imagine how we have moved from India becoming a place where the science is being respected, or science was promoted, and we are moving to the world of science in, in many ways. Quickly. Do you go through this or should I go on to other slides and wrap it up? What's What would you like to do? Yeah, let's uh, move because I think I have already covered this. Uh, it's also this is this this one just uh, this slide is also if you look at it the uh, because there have been all these organizations. I'm not why I'm saying democracy is dead. It's if you look at the Freedom House, which is in your country, you look at the Videm, which is in Sweden. The idea is that India is not anymore considered as a democracy. It's a called the partly democratic in uh, Freedom House. The Videm calls it. Uh, electoral autocracy and that has been uh, you know for the last few years now so and india being brought from a democracy to electoral autocracy it brings almost 60 70% of world's populations down to the autocracy so the democracy became only india shift made a huge change actually the pendulum shifted from the global majority of global population living in democracy now to the majority of population living in autocracies if we, I mean, I have said lots of things. Is there any hope? <laughs> um, usually, my students usually uh, also have always complained that I'm, I'm quite, uh, you know, I, I must have some hope. Uh, there is a, one thing which is happening that the opposition is consolidating, um, focusing on economic issues and job creation. Uh, Modi took the advantage because the opposition was divided. Congress party, which has been in poor power or main opposition was also not being uh, in a good shape. So I think it was uh, all kinds of things which happened. So he uh, not only uh, adopted majoritarianism, not only went for this uh, Hindu nationalism, uh, but also uh, the division among the opposition. So the, there are possibilities now, there are signs that they are coming together. Uh, they are also brought up the caste issue. That I think is a very interesting development. It happened when I was a student in India, um, but now it is back again. The caste census, they want the, because most of the thing that the most of the um, upper caste people, they have captured all sorts of political, or the um, bureaucratic positions, uh, powerful positions, and the other backward classes, not the Dalits, not the indigenous people, but other backward classes, uh, those who are the uh, called OBC in the Indian language, Indian, yeah, Indian political language, uh, they want to look at their caste census. And if they are, because there is a Indian census hasn't taken place from 2011, Indian caste census hasn't taken place uh, ever, but now one state, Bihar, did a caste census. It just came out, and many states are now saying there will be caste census. And I think that has opened, that will and that has to some extent opened something, a very different way of how the BJP will be challenged. Because BJP's main strength is to unite Hindu uh, votes. So if you bring the caste and make a caste is a big factor in the election, that's what the opposition is trying to do. Then once that will happen, then probably that will be a big change. Because I don't think you, the, uh, the India's uh, political party can only win or defeat uh, uh, BJP with the support of minority votes. They have to def divide this uh, the Hindu vote bank, which the BJP has. Uh, the Indian judiciary, I said, faces a significant challenge, but there is a current chief justice of the Supreme Court. He has displayed some signs of independence. Uh, uh, and I think he will remain Chief Justice if uh, till the election is over for some time. So if there is any kind of uh, attempt of subverting the election result, that is another factor which might work uh, of that the election is coming 2024 in a few months. Then the Modi's major financier, which is the Adani group, which became a, overnight the third or second richest for some time in the in, uh, individual in the world, uh, is facing a serious problem every day. There is a, in the last eight months, 
many things have come up that how he is manipulating the everything to get into that he and he also owns most of the india's national um, or the major strategic projects strategic in- infrastructures and his economic trouble i think which is a the, i don't know how much that will affect politically but i think the economically or the financially it might affect the political party in power uh, there is also uh, in month 2 in a couple of months or within a two months i think there are five states uh, are heading to elections uh, because there is a provincial election will take place and and this will be many of them are in the northern india which is the vote banks of our has been the traditionally supporting bjp there are in many states particularly the uh, madhya pradesh which is one of the big states uh, where it's likely to be defeated uh, it's most likely but we don't know everything what will be once the election takes place we know so if these five states bjp is defeated in all of them there is a possibility or in at least most of them that will also give a certain kind of momentum to the opposition alliance so if there is a, let's put it this way if modi wins in the 2024 election there is a big possibility that india could constitutionally become a hindu country it will not it will i mean it has become in all practical purposes a hindu country but there will be they will remove this democratic and secular foundation from the constitutions in a big way that's my uh, fear if modi loses the path of india's democracy and secularism in the it will not be that quick we must realize that it will not be that straightforward you can see very well what is happening in united states after trump so it will take time it will might take long time but there is a hope that it might be possible but in the long run i will stop here Thank you very much. We have about 15 minutes for Q&A and oh, just for, okay. for, for those who are online only, I don't have the manpower to see what your questions are in chat. So unfortunately, I won't be able to present questions from the online uh Zoom chat. So apologies for that. Does our audience here have questions? Yes sir. I'll get to you in a second. Yeah, good afternoon professor. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes I am. Please. A uh, very thought provoking uh, presentation uh, you have opened a box of pandora and you have shown us uh, a different aspect of indian uh, politics and democracy. Uh, okay sir uh, my I have two questions for you. Uh, you have mentioned on the first first slide uh, that uh, there are going concerns for democracy in india since 2014. and to support your arguments you have given uh, many points with the facts and figures uh, but aren't these things were there be- uh, before 2014 so what has changed after 2014 it is is it about only one person uh, prime minister modi or bjp party or something else is also attached to it and my second question is uh, you have shown uh, the global hunger index that india is presently 111 out of 125 countries uh, in 2014 india was at 55 from out of 120 countries but however in 2014 india's economy was 2 trillion us dollars which is 10th largest and in 2022 india is 3.7 trillion trillion with fifth largest so and these datas are uh, biased and forced just to undermine the image of india in front of a world forum of the world world forum your your views on that yeah you want me to go yeah go yeah. ahead okay. excellent questions i think this is this is very important and i mentioned um that uh, the india was not a perfect democracy before uh, india had the problems india has suffering suffer, you know going through all kinds of issues uh, I, i will be stupid to say that india was a perfect democracy perfect secular country perfect country without any um scientific uh, everything was with the, with the scientific temper uh, that why i will never say i i mean i i know india well not to really dare to say that uh, but i think why you need to realize what had happened and uh, i was explaining there has been a certain uh, area time which indian democracy has suffered i had mentioned particularly emergency period uh then also but we saw a very big improvement in the indian democratic structure Uh, particularly when the congress party lost 
this it's a it's a dominus domination all over the because then you will have a different political parties different coalitions different alliances a compromise dialogue discussions debates you 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 make it of course it looks very uh complicated difficult uh, problematic but as i said if you understand the american democracy it's not that rocket science the democracies are always like that and i think that is the time when india as i was mentioning india was thriving also economically and i don't say that it only indian economy also was doing uh, kind of well when it came into the bajpayee period to starting in the end of the bajpayee period to it continued mostly 2000 to 11 12 almost uh and that is the time which is very very difficult if you look at it the the coalition alliances were taking place saying that what has changed in 2014 the 2014 we changed because the kind of vote uh you, you see when um 98 particularly when uh, um, nine it's a 2000 sorry 99 when the bajpay came back to the power particularly uh and stayed in power 2004 yeah, well, there was a little bit of nervousness or there was a bit of nervousness that how they will do what they will do uh bajpay is a kind of political leader who also grew up in a kind of uh, post independence political uh, milieu landscape uh, he was uh, to a large extent uh, more democratic by heart uh he was a, a, a people say he was i mean i don't know how much that is true but he was say that he was a, a, a wrong man in a or oh, what do you call this a right man in a wrong party or whatever but he was he was very acceptable he was accepted outside uh his party he, he was a kind of a person who really uh bring people together uh, he has a charming persona of that nature which brings people and somehow making accommodations making you know so he was a different personality than uh, the present prime minister mr modi when mr modi came to power uh, we need to realize that uh, it's a very different type of personality came to power uh you see i i i myself had a, done a survey in gujarat uh, in um, 98 and a big survey i was there in 2002 uh after immediately after this uh, riot in ahmedabad a uh, few days after i was in 2005 was a visiting professor in ms university in baroda in gujarat i have seen from the very close quarter what kind of politician he was so it was not exactly the kind of thing that uh, it was very um, uh, surprising what happened and i think it was a of course uh, all kinds of ways i mean his persona he tried to become or uh, give an image that he is the new margaret thatcher or what you call the ronald reagan of india that time uh, in 2013 14 that's what many of the people bought he also so west also bought in many ways but also he got a majority uh, a large majority where he didn't have to uh dependent on the other parties to make this kind of uh, Mm, uh, alliances and coalitions uh, and i think that's what i mean if you would have then probably things would have been you would have somehow uh, in in a way being much more cautious and the bjp and rss they realized that that kind of national you know majoritarian nationalism really give them the possibility of growing again and they have got the power they could do it and that was not only if you look at it 2014 to 2019 they are not very sure how far that will go but when the 2019 mr modi came to power with the larger majority than in 2014 you saw a number of things which happened around during that period which made it much more difficult so it is not only modi modi is the face but of course we need to see that this he comes he represents a political mason which is represented by rss which for the first time able to get the total power from 2014 and continues to think 
that the majoritarian nationalistic or popular, whatever the way you want to say, that this is where they will, because they have possibility now to do their agenda, which has been there before for a long time. They can implement it because they always wanted a Hindu country. They always wanted those, that's, that's from the very beginning. That's why they didn't like the constitution. That's why they didn't approve the national song. That's why they didn't approve the national flag. But now they do it because they think that that's not a big deal, but they can do the other things, which is a real thing that they can make it as a Hindu country. So I think that's the difference. So it's a, it's a, it's a Modi and RSS both together, but RA, Modi is a, the face of RSS and that's what has happened from 2014. Talking about the economic issue, you know, if you go back to this Hindu rate of growth, which we were worried about, we are making big people, the world was making fun of India, but that is the time you compare India and China. India was also much doing much better taking people out of poverty during that period, despite there is a less economic growth term. When I wrote a paper actually when Manmohan Singh was the prime minister that India, well, um, uh, though economic growth went, but then our, the people, those who are coming from the poverty to poverty level to up, that decreased quite drastically. And it is, and that continued. And I think we also must realize that China has done extremely well of uplifting the people from poverty by after its economic growth. Well, India has, has failed on that. And since I'll just finish, since, since 1990, if you look at the 1990, India and China's economic rate, economic uh, per capita was almost the same, or even India was better. Yes. We have- Can I, last question? Uh, I'm sorry, he had his hand up first. So, first. yeah, so- Can I have last thought? Give, give and this will have to be the last question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, unless we, we have a little bit of time. Uh, hi, sir. I'm a Lieutenant Commander Abdullah from Pakistan Navy. Uh, sir, one of the things that what I personally feel from after 2014 that has drastically changed is India-Pakistan relationship that has drastically changed. Before that, even there was a BJP government, but we had seen President Musharraf and watched by having um, four point peace agenda, Aman Ki Asha, and all those things that happened, people to people uh, interaction that happened. And there was some hope that sometime there will be a peace and uh, these two nuclear armed countries, they can get together and have a peaceful resolution, have people to people uh, collaboration. But however, what we have seen after 2014, as you have mentioned, that there is a uh, politicization of military that we have seen in 2019, um, rhetoric against Pakistan, uh, people of Pakistan, mainly that we have seen in the media, and uh, unilaterally taking decisions of ab abrogation of Article 370. All these steps where Pakistan is trusting every other day less on the Indian government and uh, the rhetoric is on the same. So the passion has raised to a limit where rational things are kind of being not being considered anymore. So in your point of view, is there any hope of peace and collaboration between India and Pakistan, the two growing economies of the world? You see, uh, I think we need to realize if anybody could have make a peace from Indian side with Pakistan, it's either the, somebody from BJP. It's very difficult for the Congress to do it or the, any other opposition party to do it. Uh, uh, but that's why, despite my all my misgivings about uh, Modi in the 2014, I was hoping that what Bajpayee had started, he will probably able to do it. And he did started a kind of in a good note, like he invited uh, the the prime minister of Pakistan that time for his uh, oath taking. He also went on his way from Afghanistan, I think was coming back uninvited. He went to attend his uh, Pakistan prime minister's, somebody's uh, family's wedding function, uh, which I think was a kind of uh, a way he started it in the beginning. 
uh, though, but the, you see the India-Pakistan issue is extremely complicated. You have to take a number of actors, those who are involved in this part. You need to have a kind of a political um, strength, which I think he ha has because he can really deliver. But other, he, you must have also moral, mental, and uh, com convic conviction and commitment to be there in the process. As we all know, any kind of this kind of conflict of 75, 78 years conflict, that will be always when you're negotiating, will go up and down, up and down. You need to keep your politics aside and try to become a, somebody who can really do it. Uh, but unfortunately, his, his patience ran out in a very few months, past few months. Yeah, And I think because he also realized that it will be uh, better to have this kind of uh, relationship with Pakistan, which will be politically beneficial rather than having a comfortable or friendly, or forget about friendly, working relationship with Pakistan. But if you see, he is, because uh, there is a, his relationship with China. Let me put it, the China has occupied, let, I didn't bring the issue of China. China has occupied also China-India relationship. I mean, probably United States is thinking something else. Forget about that. But China has taken large part of the Indian territory, at least to 2,000 square kilometer. Not Indian. I mean, it was a disputed territory, but it was under Indian control. And that is taken by China. But the, till now, the Prime Minister Modi hasn't even uttered a single word about China. He doesn't name China. He has even on rec or I mean, what we know, and it has been confirmed by the American diplomats, he has even said America not to bring up that issue. Why? Why he takes a tough position against Pakistan and takes this kind of position against China? Because in China case, he realizes that he cannot really show his strong man image. He can do it and to get the votes and he will be always in the, you know, in a side which is not. But in the Pakistan side, he can really have that upper hand. He can do it and it also has goes against this Hindu nationalist that you can also target Muslims in India. So I think it is, it's a, it's a, the, the India-Pakistan relationship which he could have done it in the beginning, but he thought that it is very it is important for him for his own politics rather than India's national interest. Do you have time for one more question? Oh, I, yeah, I, it's okay, absolutely. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Professor. I'm uh, Commander Vikrant from Indian Navy. I'll be very precise to my question uh, with respect to the military under scrutiny. Uh, now you have the mostly the entire talk has been about the government after 2014, uh, which is mostly led by the Modi and the BJP government. But the only use of military which was done against uh, civil populace was in 84, where emergency was given and Operation Blue Star was undertaken. In the recent past, I don't see any military being deployed and used against civil power or used as an aid to the civil power by the government. So what are the basis of these allegations that you have put in the presentation? Uh, second question is about the COVID-19 challenge. Uh, COVID, COVID was a very difficult time for everyone. And we do understand people had few imaginations how this COVID will go because no research could be done. Uh, but the, uh, the country which was at the forefront of finding out the, uh, the exact solution and getting a vaccine and with most of the people getting vaccine and even giving out vaccine to the other countries as a goodwill gesture was no one else than India under the leadership of this, uh, this government. So how do we say we will have people who will have who will have uh, voodoo science logics to everything, but we will have leadership which will which is actually going to do good. So how do we rather justify this? Two Second, questions. Yeah, sir. Uh, sorry, you, you want to say something? Sorry. No, so that's it, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, no, I think I have a very simple answer to the second question. Second, I, I will I'll answer your first question, but one second. I think you should read the WHO report, not to read what the government says. 
Of course, you, I mean, of course, I don't understand that why you say that, but I think it's important that we must look at the reports which has come from the WHO, why it is not accepted by Indian government, what, how many people died in India, who actually, which, I mean, we, the kind of uh, the, the Indian vaccine, where it was given, who gave it, how much percentage of Indian vaccines or Indian origin vaccine was used. India is not new in the vaccine productions. India has a world's leader in the vaccine production. It's nothing new, but why really it didn't work out or what has worked out, what has, how many people died. That's something so I will leave it up to you to look at the WHO report. But I think it is more, I think the, the most important question is the one which you started. I agree with it. That India, which is, uh, went to the or the 1984, um, in the uh, Operation Blue Star. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, Science Operation Blue Star. Yeah, Operation Blue Star, 1984, um, it was uh, uh, done. I mean, uh, uh, and that became a major issue. And still, this, uh, uh, the, you, if you look at the uh, Sikh separatists, uh, uh, movement, which is a little in the Indian side, but mostly in the diaspora side. Uh, the basic things goes to that uh, 1984 military operation. I totally agree with that one. But I think we need to realize uh, the military operations which are being used. Military now is also being used in Manipur, isn't it? Uh, Assam rifle, what is that one? So the Assam, Assam rifles, uh, if you go back to the history, which has been placed since our independence and formation of the defense forces, it is not something new which has been formed by the no, government. No, I'm, I'm not I'm saying new. I'm saying that it is being always, I mean, army is also in the Kashmir continuously. So army has been continuously being used. Let's not to discuss that one. But I think what has happened is here that a party... If you look at 2019 election, the way the Prime Minister Modi went to the election with the attack, which is the terror attack, took place in the Pulwama in Kashmir. After that, there was this uh, air strike, whether there has been the debate, whether it was successful or not. There was no evidences, but we don't really get into that discussion. But to make that an election issue, and not only election issue to demonize not only Pakistan, not only Kashmiris, also Muslims openly, that's where the political and the creating the kind of uh, political posters using the army uh, for your political elections. That's what I'm saying, the politicization of military taking place. The kind of persons who was also appointed, you know, the uh, um, what you call that chief, chief of uh, joint forces or whatever he was, uh, uh, and then he died in the helicopter crash. And if you really wanted to do it, uh, why you were, didn't appoint him for a long period of time? And then what is happening now to that position? These kind of things, which is even you ask the military to create the bridge for the uh, Sri Sri uh, doing a function in Jamuna. I mean, you, you come up, I will give you a number of examples how it is being used and abused. And I think it is very important that... Uh, a military is 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 a military is uh, is a secular character has to be not only maintained but it has to be respected. It doesn't need to be only what it is. It's also shown to the world that it is there. So it is extremely important that we follow that part. Uh, I mean, of course, we can disagree, but I think this is the that's the way I say it. Thank you, Dr. Swain, uh, for your presentation and Q&A. Uh, we appreciate your time and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch for another uh, such event down the road. But thank you. Uh, thank we you. really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you.